it is not enough to simply say the FBI did it or retired FBI agents or former FBI agents uh, killed Dr. King. I mean, that has been a view that 10 years ago was certainly much in vogue, but it's much more complicated than that. So when you run into data that says the FBI did this or the CIA did that, uh, you have to be very careful or you have to investigate a little further because what it really is probably is the overlap of the two. In early 1968, Myron Billet, a gopher for the Mafia, drove two senior mob figures, Sam Giancana and John Roselli, to a meeting with federal agents at a motel near the small town of Appalachian in upstate New York. At the meeting, the Mafia leaders were offered a contract to kill Martin Luther King. They were Roselli, Sam, myself, and a uh, free guy from the FBI, and a uh, free poor guy from came in from New York, the mob, and, uh, but they, they were the one that, the FBI and the CIA were the one that came up with a the hit. They won to come up with a million dollars. They wanted to pay the mob a million dollars to make a hit. And uh, Sam said, no way. No way we're going to get involved in nothing like that. Who was it who made the suggestion, a CIA man or an FBI man? CIA man. Myron Billet is a dying man. We think it's unlikely that he would tell such a story now if it weren't true. And it's documented fact that Roselli and Giancana were contracted by the CIA to kill Castro. If they rejected the CIA's offer on King, there is evidence that a contract with local mob figures in Memphis may have been affected. In Memphis, we were aware of several frightened witnesses. Bill Pepper is taking us to see one of them. I found a very fearful man with John. I found him very fearful then, and I find him now increasingly fearful. Uh, the first night I saw him, he insisted on our retiring to a, a room in the back of the garage, general store, and sitting with the lights out. I, I saw him again, and he always reminded me that he, he, he wasn't really unduly paranoid, but that, in fact, he had been shot at, and people had attempted to, uh, to kill him, and he had been beaten up, and he, at one point, was hospitalized. There's a basis for his <laughs> profound uneasiness. Do you think he'll talk to us this afternoon? I don't know whether he'll talk to us this afternoon. He vacillates. just very, very afraid uh, to come on camera and to say anything about this matter. Can you tell us, Bill, what's his story? On April 4th, 1968, at 5.15 in the afternoon, John McFerrin went to Liberto and Latch Produce Company to do his shopping. It was his last stop of the day before coming back to summer. Shortly after he entered the place, he heard a man, he, he originally called the fat man, Frank Liberto, on the telephone. Heard Liberto uh, say, words to the effect, shoot the son of a bitch when he comes on the balcony. Don't come round here. Don't call me here. Go to New Orleans and pick up your money from my brother. The conversation ended at that point. The Fern didn't think too much about that conversation until 6.30 p.m. He heard that Martin Luther King had been assassinated shortly after 6. Then it all made sense to him. He gave a statement to the, uh, the FBI. Memphis Police Department and investigators, and eventually the House Select Committee on Assassinations. They all disregarded his comments and ignored. I've known John for 10 years. I believe John had a crucial bit of information that was never looked at properly, never followed up, and disregarded. And the only reason it would have been disregarded was because it was inconvenient to the scenario that uh, became, in effect, the official story. But one example is Lloyd Jowers, who owned Jim's Grill. Jim's Grill was the place uh, 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 beyond which, through the back door of which, the Lorraine Motel could be seen, and there was a whole area of bushes. 
And Lloyd Jowers came to know that we had found four witnesses who would, were providing us independently with enough evidence against him so that he would be indicted if a grand jury ever heard the evidence. So he got, uh, he panicked and he asked his lawyer to go get him uh, immunity from prosecution, which the lawyer did, go, didn't get it. He went to talk to the prosecutor and he was very chuffed. He said, look, I'm, I represent Mr. Lloyd Jowers and, and he um, was involved in a conspiracy to kill Martin Luther King and he knows a lot of the details of that and who was involved and a lot of the planning was done right in his own, his own grill and it was used as a staging area, the grill and the rooming house upstairs. And Lloyd will tell you all this, everything he knows. But you just got to give him immunity. <coughs> well, long story short, not only did Lloyd Jarvis not get immunity, but he was never even interviewed by the district attorney or any of his stuff. They just didn't want to know anything about changing the official story in this case. But Jarvis was still panicking because I was determined to try to get him for that grand jury. So I asked a colleague of mine, a lawyer, Wayne Chastain, to sit outside the grand jury room and just seek to get in there. And every time the, 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 uh, the foreman of the grand jury came out, he went in to tell him you had this evidence about the killing of Martin Luther King, you had this evidence of this crime, that it was a continuing crime, and you wanted him, you wanted to testify to the grand jury. Just badger and badger and badger and stay there. So Wayne sat there, there for a couple of weeks, and of course, they ignored him totally. And uh, the grand jury was under the control of the district attorney general's office, and they, they didn't want to hear it. So <coughs> Jowers knew we were trying to get into that grand jury. So he, he, he then offered to go on a program uh, conducted by a reasonably independent guy named Sam Donaldson called Primetime Live. And he went on that television program, ABC, uh, primetime live program, and he told the story of how he was approached by a man called Frank Liberto, who was a produce dealer in Memphis and who was a part of the Marcello organization. Memphis came within Carlos Marcello's domain, which stretched all the way out to Texas and even uh, Southern California. So, um, <clears throat> Liberto came offered him $100,000, called in a big due bill and said, hey, you gotta help us with, with, this, uh, with this, this killing, this murder. And, and Jowers was given various tasks to do as a part of the, uh, part of the team that was going to carry out the, the killing. And it was a mafia contract killing. Um, so Lloyd knew we had gotten information that could indict him. He, he, pushed it, uh, he told the story in the Donaldson program, said, I'll tell you all the details of this, all the facts, all the evidence if I get immunity. He was still trying for that. <coughs> uh, don't you know, it, that television program and that event never became newsworthy. Nobody heard about that. Even ABC News the next morning didn't report it, and it was their own program the night before. Usually, uh, when uh, uh, King would come to Memphis, well, even I, uh, if he was uh, at the church or something, we would, uh, maybe I'd have maybe 20 men uh, within that block. He had plenty of security. We knew he was coming. We'd have men at the airport to meet him, and we tried to give him more security than we could give him. If security was always supplied to Dr. King, why was the seven-man police unit attached to him stripped away only 24 hours before the assassination? Under close questioning from the House Assassinations Committee, Memphis Police Director Frank Holloman denied that he had authorized the removal or had known about it at the time. On top of that, it's a matter of public record that three 12-man police tactical units were pulled back five blocks from the vicinity of the Lorraine Motel on the morning of the assassination. Now, on this occasion, the TACCAR units were withdrawn at some point on the day of the 4th of April, weren't they? <coughs> no, the, 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 my course was never withdrawn. Uh, uh, to, uh, well, uh, April 4th. No, we still had cars in the area. Wasn't there some suggestion that they were pulled back at the request of uh, one of Dr. King's party, that they were pulled back a number of blocks? No, uh, uh, to my knowledge now, 
And the only way they'd been pulled back was on my command. 